Say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. And my spirit is receptive to the living Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn to two or three people around you here this morning and say, hey, you're looking good. This is the uh, good looking church by faith. Praise God. Amen. And today I'm going to be talking about how God is a jealous God. And I really uh, want you to understand this. Do you realize that we live in an age that has more distractions than any other time in the history of man to take people away from God. We've got cell phones. I mean, you can't even have a conversation, a normal conversation at the dinner table, and that's if you eat at the dinner table anymore because everyone's got their cell phone out. And so at Thanksgiving and Christmas and all those other times, uh, uh, July 4th, uh, no one's talking to each other. We're looking on our cell phones to see who's liking any post that we just put up there about, you know, George Washington or something. <laughs> uh, uh, it, we're we have more distractions than ever before. We have more, more things coming into our mind more than ever before. And all these things take men away from God. And I mean that in the genetic sense that men and women, but the genesis of man. Let's go over to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 34, and I'm going to pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over our time together here this morning. We give you glory, and we give you honor, and we give you praise. Father, I ask that this word would come forth as a, as a, a good meal, a spiritual meal for your people, delivered in the right order according to your will and according to your mind. And Father, I ask that these lips of clay would speak out your powerful truths in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. Exodus chapter 34. I'm going to start in verse 10. Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a new covenant before all your people. I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations, and all the people among whom you live will see the working of Yahweh, for it is a fearful thing that I'm going to perform. And again, I just need to make an explanation why I'm reading Yahweh rather than Lord. Uh, the word that you're seeing in your Bible as L-O-R-D in the English is this word right here in Hebrew, yud hey. Vav and Hey. That's what's actually in the Hebrew. It's been a word that's been covered up for 2,000 years, uh, mostly because of what the Jews first started doing. And then those that didn't know how to interpret Hebrew would go to Jewish clerics and they would conceal the name beginning 2,000 years ago. It has not been revealed only until recent times. But it's always been there for the last 3,500 years in the Old Testament. And so when we read that now, uh, we have a study. I have a study in back there. It's called God's name 7,000 times in the Bible. 7,000 times. And he says over 150 times, honor my name. Lord is a title. Lord is not a name. If we call, if someone says Lord, and then they have the name of their small g God after that, you know, whether it's in Japan or whether it's in India or whether it's in another country that has a lot of foreign gods, they're calling them Lord. Then they give their name. I don't want to give their name here in the sanctuary, but you know the names, some of them, right? We call him Lord God and his, he is Lord and he is God. If we call him Lord God in Hebrew, it sounds in English to us, it's, it's Adonai Elohim or Elohim Adonai, it's reversed. But if we, call him, if we call him Lord and his name, then his name is Yahweh. And so I'm gonna be saying his name repeatedly here today. Uh, and again, I just need to explain that so people don't think we've gone off the deep end. I do a lot, I study a lot of Hebrew and I just want everyone to know that. All right. So in verse 12, watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall not worship any other God for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. I want to stop here and have you think about this. If someone is named a name as a slur, or if someone is named, named something at, because of their reputation, 
I remember years ago I said about uh, a, a, I said about a man because I had heard it. Re, I heard heard it. I said, "There's a shark in your swimming pool." And I was referring to this guy that was working in my company, and I, I went to another person, and I said, there's a shark in your swimming pool. In other words, you're dealing with a guy that's got a lot more uh, business sense than you may realize. Look out. And when someone is given a name, generally it's because of some form of a reputation that they have earned. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. So uh, not always. Sometimes slurs are just slurs or condemning slurs, but generally when someone has a, some sort of a nickname, it's because they're known for something. And here God has a nickname, and his name, as we're reading here, is Jealous, whose name is Jealous, is a, or he is a jealous God. And the, by the way, that word jealous comes out twice here in the Hebrew. I could read it to you in the Hebrew, but uh, you wouldn't understand it. Here's this. Kana means jealous. And when you go to the Hebrew lexicon to look up what jealous means, immediately in the Hebrew lexicons, it'll show not only the word jealous in English, but it'll show zealous with a Z in English. And it sounds alike. Zealous for something. If you're zealous for something, you're zealous to get something done. You're zealous because you like a team. You're zealous because uh, you're always, you have a lot of zeal in your life. or You have a lot of zeal for a subject matter. You have a lot of zeal for God. If I change that a little bit, if I take that zeal and just change it a little bit and give it a little bit of a negative connotation, I can turn zealous into jealous. And what that means is, is now that person is jealously watching over something. The Bible talks a lot about uh, jealousy that the husband is, a lot, is allowed to have for his wife. And there's levels of jealousy that is allowed scripturally. And then it can go down to a place where jealousy is not allowed at that level. It gets too weird. It gets too overbearing. It gets too controlling. But God is a jealous God. Why is he a jealous God? He made you and me. He made us in his image. We were made in his image and in his likeness. We were made to look like him. We have the contours. The Bible is very clear about this when you study these words out. That in the Hebrew, we were made with the curvatures. In fact, the words are the planking on a boat. And if you've ever seen boat making go on and they're making boats the old fashioned way and they get the ribs on first and we all have ribs in our innards. And then the planking goes on. This is what it means to be in his likeness. And the planking is put in water and it's bent and it's curved and it's nailed down until it's firmly covered over the ribs. God has planking over his, his material ribs. God is spirit, but he is spiritual materiality. He's not Casper the friendly ghost. He's not floating around bedsheet in the wind. He has form and he has fashion. All right. And we were made in his image. So we have, you know, we're not a box. We're not some automaton box. We're not square robot, you know, made in a 50s you know, sci-fi movie where we have form and fashion and we're like him on the inside. So when he made the highest creation that he ever made, man, there is nothing else that equals man. Monkeys in the jungle don't equal man. There is no animal, there's no fish, there's no bear that equals man. I've heard people make all kinds of comments. Oh, well, you know, we came from the primordial slime and, and you know, you, my relatives fell out of a tree as a monkey and maybe your relatives, but not mine. Amen. And we were made in his image. And with his likeness. That means not only do we have his shape and his form, but we have his authority inside of us and we have the capability to use his authority. The animal kingdom cannot. And so he is jealous over you. He is zealous for what he made. He made us with, with zeal and now he's jealous. And how do I know that he's, he, he made us with zeal? He created the earth on day one. He, he made the, he separated the waters from the waters on day two, creating an atmosphere. On day three, he put more stuff in there. On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars appear. And not just appear, they're created on day four. Why do I know this is so important? We live on a privileged planet. There's no other planet in the entire universe. The odds of living on another planet, having another planet like this anywhere in the universe are trillions and trillions and trillions of odds to one. 
It cannot occur anywhere else. This singular rock was the only rock in the universe for three whole 24-hour days. So God made us zealously. He produced everything. He gave us a habitable planet. He put us down on here in day six. And then he said, worship me. And any time that we don't go and worship him, he becomes jealous for his creation. Any time that we move away from him, he becomes jealous. I'm jealous over my wife. If she, was, if she was being approached by another man and that man started to flirt with her, my jealousy would flare up. Another word for jealousy is to have color in the face, in the Hebrew. And so, so to have, have color in the face, blood in the face, is another term for jealousy in the Hebrew. So God's jealousy is always there. He has a love for you that's always there. And then if something flares up where you begin to fall away from him, he flares up and gets red faced, red nosed. And he flares up with his jealousy towards you, calling you back, wanting you to worship him once again. This is why we don't attempt to make any images of God. God is uh, such, so great and so powerful to make an image and then have people begin to worship that image would cause him to become jealous as well. This is why we're not to have idols and icons and different types of things. We're not to, we're not to attempt to draw a picture. I know people try to do that and, and on the internet, you know, there's God up there somewhere and but God is a jealous God. There is no way we could represent him as human beings on canvas or on artwork or on our computer. There's no way we could come remotely close. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen. <clears throat> Man today has all types of gods. Let's think about it. Uh, we have gods of political leaders all over the world. Uh, the news is full of politics all the time. We have gods of sports. If someone is really good in sports, everyone idolizes them. If they're good in football or basketball, everyone idolizes them or baseball. We have uh, gods in business. And I can tell you something about business. I've been in business all my life since I was very young. And I can tell you that men that move to the top, you don't realize this because many of you are not in the level of business that I'm, uh, that I'm familiar with. But in the Wall Street type of circles, and that doesn't have to be on Wall Street, but the Wall Street types of circles that exist all over the planet and all over the United States, Within those organizations, there are gods within those organizations, and, and those people, they're almost like untouchable. They're almost, they, people come to almost worship them because of all the money they make or all the power that they have. We have many gods, and God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to have any other, any other distractions. If we are married, and you tell your wife, you know, you're the best thing that happened to me and you're saved. You're not telling the truth. The best thing that happened to you is you got saved. The second best thing that happened to you is you found a good spouse, a great spouse. Amen. Can I hear an amen? And so there, even in our, our sometimes what we call careless discussion when we're talking about things or sitting outside, maybe grilling or traveling or just having a conversation at the dinner table, we have to be careful even what we say because God is a jealous God. It's God first, marriage second, kids third. Not kids above God, not kids above the spouse. That's out of order. Amen. Amen. So, where people are not also zealous for God and for God's word, uh, I think that um, there's a lot of disrespect and every evil work. In fact, uh, within Christian churches today, you'll see uh, uh, many times people will come in, and, and this is almost always generally uh, typical of what I'll call church floaters, people that are just going from church to church to church and not really nailed down anywhere. That means they have no pastor that can speak for them. They have no, uh, they have no roots. Uh, they're kind of like a tumbleweed. And they may have been to 20 or 30 churches in just two or three years. And, and, and the moment that the pastor begins to get their number, uh, they pick up and leave. They take their toys and they go home. Uh, because they, you know, they, they, they're not denying God. But whenever there's not a true zeal for God, a real zeal for God, I mean a real zeal for God in the hearts of men. And we're talking about ourselves here today.
Whenever there's not a real zeal, we are the, those that same group of people or individuals, they're not going to have a zeal for God's word. And if they don't have a zeal for God's word, then they're going to violate all kinds of, of godly commands about the order of ministry and the order of church, which I'm going to talk about at length next week. And the order of how churches are run is something that's set down by God, not by men. God expects men to carry it out. If God wanted angels to preach, he would have made the angels preach. But instead, angels rather get you out of trouble so you can go back and preach once again. Angels got Paul and Silas out of jail in Acts, and they went back to the synagogue that they were preaching in to get in, in basically in more trouble. But the angel of God came and released them so they could go back and preach, not the angel going back in there. God wants us to minister, and God uses humankind for order and for platform so that others may fall in the line in the order and the platform. And by doing so, if you know what that is, when you're doing it right, you give order in the sanctuary, you give order in the ministry, and then as a result of it, you give honor to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? So, one of the ways that we give honor to God and, and that we show that we're zealous back for him is by our uh, religious ceremonies. And by worship, we had worship and praise here this morning. I love worship and praise. I just, I just love, you know, the fact that I don't have to be up here and, and anymore, and and I can be, I can just be worshiping and praising and and just enjoying the music. I love that. And when we come into His presence, one of the things that we do, and we should be cognizant of that, that w when we're in worship, this is this is a way to honor Him. Remember, He's jealous of our time. How many? T I mean, I, I'm an old ex rock and roller, you know, back from the '60s and the '70s. And you know, I got a pierced ear, and I used to have long hair and all that. And you know, I've, I've been down that road. I've been, I mean, you just if the just the right rock and roll song comes on back from the late '60s or the early '70s, crank it way up in my car, you know, boom, and I, boom, and I got the steering wheels, I'm driving. You know, I'm in my 60s. You think I would have gotten over that by now? If God is a jealous God, I, be, I better be doing more worship to him than I better be doing of some old 60s song. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because God is a jealous God. He would not have me use even as much as a fraction of the time to just enjoy some old song as he would want me to enjoy worshiping in his house and before him and worshiping with his music. Can I hear an amen? amen. So God is a jealous God. Let's go over to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11. In fact, the uh, word for jealousy or the zeal of jealousy is intensely jealous. Intensely jealous. Hebrews chapter 11 I love this chapter because I call it the faith chapter. And we can see here in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If you're reading from your King James Bible, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance. It is a power. It, ha it is real. Electricity is a substance. And how do I know that? I see the electric bill come in once a month. I know they're billing me for something. Amen. Faith is a substance. Lights, when the electricity comes on, the lights can come on. When faith comes on, miracles can begin to occur. All, the, all kinds of things can be set up and get in order in your life. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or conviction of things not seen. So faith is real. It's tangible. For by it, faith, the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Okay, now jump down to verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Why do people not give God full honor? They don't believe that there's a reward system in it. 
And a lot of people don't even like this kind of discussion. You know, back to, we talked about this just in the past couple of weeks when we were talking about uh, the evidence of, of, of God in this country at the very inception. Every single signer of the Declaration of Independence was a Christian. You hear all kinds of, of weird stuff. All 55 signers of the Declaration, three were Christians. That is ridiculous. Everyone was a Christian. In fact, even during the Civil War in 1865, you had one whole side praying and the other whole side praying the, con the Confederate South to the Union North. Everyone was praying to the same God. Everyone. The officers were in front of everyone. Everyone was praying. This is a religious country formed on godly principles, on biblical godly principles. And when we right now say... Well, there's no reward system to honoring God. We have slipped a great deal in the last 150 years. We have moved completely away from what this country used to believe, though we used to believe. Now, we can't get the whole country back. I believe we're in the end times. We're in the end of the end of the end times, right? And the Bible tells me that the earth is going to get worse, not better. But those who know their God Amen. will do great exploits. Amen. Amen. So, let's look at this again. And without faith, verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. In other words, he exists. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So there is a reward system for believing in God. You know, this Christian life, it's, there's so many benefits in this Christian life that uh, if you're not aware of the benefits and, and most Christians are not. Most Christians, the only benefit they know of, I think I'm going to go to heaven. And that's because of bad teaching. The teaching has gotten so bad in the pulpits, people don't teach from the Bible anymore. They teach what they, they think the people want to hear. And if you teach them something that they definitely don't want to hear, you watch. You'll thin out the crowd in just a couple weeks or a couple months. Tell them what they need to hear and watch the crowd get thinned out. God is, has a reward system if we honor him. Can I hear an amen? amen. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed that people do is they kind of shy away about talking about God and, and uh, then they begin to shy away uh, over all kinds of uh, other things. And the moment you start worrying about whether or not you're going to be able to talk to other people about God or not or other people about Jesus Christ is you let worry come in. And worry, worry is that stronghold that the devil loves to use. Worry is, is, the op, worry is faith working against you. All right, so if you have, you, a bill comes in. Let me just kind of give a, something that everyone's, everyone's seen before, had happened to them before. A bill comes in. You weren't expecting the bill. You were expecting the bill. The bill's bigger, the bill's smaller. Anyway, you're looking at the bill. You don't have the money to pay it right at the moment. And the first thought many times is to get afraid looking at that bill. But you just got it. You got 30 days to pay it or, you know, or, or maybe you got a, a tax bill. You, you made more money than you did last year and you didn't pay in enough. And so you have this big tax bill or something like that. That just happened to Kathy and I recently. And I, I went and started speaking to that thing. And that was just like, what, a month ago or so? A big tax bill. I thought, oh, my goodness, they didn't take out enough money last year. And I looked at that and fear wanted to come up over me. And I just kept speaking to it. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know how it was going to get paid off. But I kept speaking to that. You're not talking to me. I'm talking to you. Well, many times you can let things talk to you that shouldn't be talking to you. Amen. And so I began speaking back to that and speaking back to that. And I think we paid it off after just three weeks or something like that. It was just a miracle that occurred for us to be able to do that. Because we didn't let it talk to us. We talked to it. So instead of it producing worry in us, with his, which is faith in reverse, we talked faith to it and we spoke to it and we commanded it to be gone in Jesus' name. And now it's gone. And, and they're taking out enough out of my paycheck now, praise God. So I won't, won't have to worry about that in the future if ever I would worry. And you know what worry does? Worry gives small things big shadows, doesn't it? Right? Worry gives tiny little things big shadows. When people come to me, and, and, and now, you know, as I'm getting up there in years, I'll, uh, people will come to me, younger men will come to me, and, and they give me their problems that they're dealing with, and I'll go, aw, and intentionally, I'll go, aw, shucks. And the first thing that does is it just lets people off the hook going like, oh, he doesn't think this is a big deal. It might be the first opinion he has that this is not a big deal. That he's heard from anyone. He goes to his parents and his parents go, oh, flip out. Oh, what are you going to do? You know, goes to his banker. What are you going to do? Goes to his accountant. What are you going to do? 
right? Comes to me and go, aw, shucks, don't worry about it. And that's maybe the first positive word that they've, they've gotten. Now they begin to go and take that worry, change it into faith, and start speaking to that situation that they're dealing with, right? Worry gives small things big shadows, and we begin to focus on the wrong things because of it. Amen. Now, let's go over to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Psalms 1. Starting in verse 1. It starts out saying, how blessed. Everyone say, how blessed. how blessed. Look at that. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, or his delight is in the, the word law there is a real, uh, an incorrect uh, interpretation. It, the word law is not really there. It is the word of teaching, but his delight is in the teachings of Yahweh. That word law there has been overused and, and mistranslated in the majority of the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms. The word law simply means teachings. It doesn't mean covenantal laws. It means teachings. But his delight is in the teachings of Yahweh. And in his teachings, he meditates day and night. Everyone say day and night. Day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Do you get that? That there is a reward system for honoring God. God is a jealous God. But on the other hand, if we give him all of our attention and all of our love, if God the Father is zealous for his name, then he is also zealous to bless. If he is zealous in making us and making the earth the singular rock in the universe to place mankind on, if he is zealous for that, then he is zealous to bless he wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. He wants good things to come to you. But those good things cannot come for saved or unsaved people unless there's a complete honor for Yahweh Elohim and honor for his house. You know, one of the ways that I know that I learned before, long before I ever became a preacher was always to be in church at least once a week. Once I got saved, I was so happy to be saved. I, 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 and when I told people that I was saved, I was, I'm saved, I'm saved. And then I would tell people that and they go, what are you talking about? And I would explain it to them. And most people, even today, I don't think get it. I am still to this day, 40 years later, I am so happy to be saved. I am delighted to be saved. Kathy and I, we must talk about it three or four nights a week. Where would we be without Jesus Christ? Where would we be? I don't know. We don't even want to think about it. But the little bit that we do think about, we discuss it openly. Where would this marriage be without Jesus Christ? Where would our kids be without Jesus Christ? This is a big deal. And so when I got saved, I knew I got saved. I mean, I had a radical transformation inside, which I knew eventually would show up on the outside. And I thought, you know what? If he would honor me, with his son Jesus going to the cross, then I'm going to honor him by being in church every week. And one of the things that God wants to see is he's, if he's a zealous God, jealously protect, he wants to know if you're zealous for him. And one of the ways you can show him is by being in his house at least once a week. Now a word on biblical giving. Then we'll return to the message. If you would, please turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And he's given these commandments. He said, you shall not have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth, beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And you shall not take the, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you give all you have to the Lord your God, you love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your spirit, all your energy. He is going to bless you. He is going to take you in his embrace, and he is going to take care of you. 
he is going to be listening for your prayers because he loves you. And sometimes we think we're not all that lovable or we don't deserve it. And it's true. We are not all that lovable and we all do not deserve it. But God loves us anyway. And, and he believes that, you know, he's got a place for us. So when you take um, your tithing and your, your offerings and it comes right off the top like cream on fresh milk from a fresh milk cow, there's cream rises to the top. You take that cream off and you give it to the Lord. You give him the best of everything you have. You do the best you can for him. You give him your excellence and you, and you will not regret it for a moment. So if you want to raise up your offerings, because you know, your offering, Yahweh is a jealous God. And you know what? He wants your respect. He wants your worship. He wants you to worship him. And that's why we have worship before we have our offering time. Because we want to worship with our money. And we want to worship with everything we've got. So, Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, we just lift up our offerings to you. We give you thanks and praise and honor and glory because you are a great God. You are a good, good, good father. And we thank you, Lord God, for your protection, for your blessing, for your wisdom, Lord God, above all things for your wisdom. And we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory for you are God. You are our God. And we love you. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. You may give three easy ways by going to mountainfaith.org, calling 608-356-1804, extension 101, or by writing David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 53940. Give your best today. And I thought, you know what? If he would honor me, with his son Jesus going to the cross, then I'm going to honor him by being in church every week. And one of the things that God wants to see is he's, if he's a zealous God, jealously protect, he wants to know if you're zealous for him. And one of the ways you can show him is by being in his house at least once a week. And I made sure I was in his house once a week, then I made sure I was in his house twice a week. You know, now that I'm a preacher, I get to come here all the time. Amen. But you ought to be in the house once a week. It's a way, it's, it, is, it is a way for you to show a jealous God where your heart is. And most Christians don't have that anymore. Particularly spirit-filled Christians, which I, I, breaks my heart. It's got to break the, the Holy Spirit's heart. Like, really? You can't be in church today? You got to golf today? You got to do this? You know, you got to be at the fair today because your kids are showing horses? What? Really? So how do we honor God? We do it with weekly attendance. That's a barometer. Let's go over to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel 2 verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons were doing to all of Israel. All right, so his sons. Eli is the priest, the high priest. His sons are acting wickedly within the temple, right? And how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting, all right? So the, his sons are, are, are just doing wicked things with the, with the wives of, 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 of husbands, but they're coming there to serve in the temple. And they're doing it in church. Eli said to his sons, why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear from Yahweh's people circulating. All right. So he talks to them. He tells them to stop doing it, but he doesn't go and, and, and cause further things to happen. He doesn't bring any further discipline. Listen, this is a grievous uh, error before God. He should have been extremely hard on his sons and, and took them outside the meeting tent, either had them stoned or just fired them from their job. So you can go in the farming. You guys can't be here. All right. You don't deserve to be here. In fact, they were getting fat. They were getting lazy on all the offerings that were coming in. We're going to read that here in a moment. Verse 25, if one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against Yahweh, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for Yahweh desired to put them to death. 
Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor, both with Yahweh and with men. And the man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar and burn incense and to carry the ephod before me? And did I give the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering? which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choices of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now, everyone say, but now. <laughs> but now, Yahweh declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. I want you to think about this. The sons of Eli were doing wrong. When you have a minister, a minister back then and today represents God to men and also represents the men to God, even more so back then than today. So what a minister does is a very heavy deal with God. The Bible tells us over in James, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, for you shall incur a stricter judgment. Why, what is that stricter judgment? People are watching us, and not just me, but they're watching you too. And they're watching to see where your heart is at. And they're watching to see if you're going to stumble and fall. In fact, they're hoping that you're going to take a stumble and fall. Because that will bring you down, back down to their level in their eyes. I think that um, too many times that people have forgotten their response, that God is a real true God. And they just get careless with ministry. They get careless in ministry. They get careless when they come into the, into the sanctuary here. We call this the Holy of Holies in here. You know, that outer area is the, is the, is the inner court in, in our land and everything like that. That's like the outer court. So we have three sections like the temple back there has three sections. And uh, when we come in here, we warn people, you don't just talk about anything in the sanctuary. You, you want to wait and have a, con a callous conversation, wait until you get out on the ground somewhere if you're going to have it. But don't have it in the sanctuary. This is a holy place. And, 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 and we want people to understand that God's presence is here. I know people have told me that first time visitors watch us on TV or, or watch us uh, live online. They come to our, our, this church for the first time and they come in, they go, I felt the presence of God the moment I drove on the property. Well, we have prayer concerning that. We want them to feel the presence, but that presence comes at a price. That presence comes that we make sure that we don't bring things into this property that are evil or that are wicked. God see these, sees these things. And people think that God, you know, God just kind of overlooks all that. No, God, God takes account of what's going on and he rewards those who are zealous for him. He rewards those that are, are, that are going to speak well about him and, and, and represent him well to the public. And people just don't get that. Not anymore. So how do we, how do we, how do, we do this thing right? We have Sunday worship. We have faith speaking. We have uh, resisting uh, slack religious practices. Uh, if I make any enemies with people, uh, with other ministers and other people who want to kind of come up in ministry, the biggest thing that I make enemies over, y'all ready? I'm going to tell you a secret, is making sure there's no slack in this ministry. And I don't mean slack with money or slack with work. That is important too to God. But slack allowing things in that shouldn't be here. Yeah. Having a clean ministry, a clean house, is a product of work. And it's a product of zeal. Eli did not have the zeal God wanted him to have. And he let his sons go willy-nilly everything. And it was wrong. It was evil. 
When you see a man of God really doing a good job, and I don't mean a bunch of rules and, and whether people have tattoos or smoke cigarettes or any of that other man-made stuff. I'm talking about the rules that we can find within the Word of God that are proper for today. And I tell you what, people like Jesus said, they strain out the gnat and swallow the camel, Jesus said. Right? They got all these rules and rules and rules in their churches, and yet they let the biggest sins come in. Adulterers, fornicators, homosexuals come in and speak from their pulpit. Or maybe uh, so ungodly people, they've got even other gods in their house. Wicked people. And one of the things that we have to do today is we have to purge it from our homes. We have to make sure that when you see leadership doing it here or any other church, that we're in agreement with the purging of those things. Listen, not everyone's perfect. And many of us have stained backgrounds. And, and you know, in other words, we got, you know, we had to have an egg and, and all of a sudden it got scrambled. But God can do something with a scrambled egg. Right? As long as you're, you've cleaned up your life. As long as you've cleaned up your life, but those that choose not to clean it up or just feign like they've cleaned it up. They can't be allowed to come in here. And that is one of the biggest things that causes people to become enemies with me personally. I ain't perfect. I don't declare that I am. But I'm going to do the best I can to make sure we're not wrongly going to have the wrong people in our pulpit in this ministry. As much as I can. Humanly. And a lot of people don't like, ah, you're just restricting the Holy Spirit. No, I'm not. That person don't have the Holy Spirit. Just because they look like they have or they know a couple of scriptures about the Holy Spirit doesn't make them spirit filled. Amen. Amen. And so God is a jealous God for his pulpit, for his sanctuary, for his people. And as a minister of the gospel, if you don't, you may not remember this story, but it was prophesied his sons were going to die and he was going to die in the same day. Sure enough, his sons died in battle. A word, a runner came back. He was so fat. He's sitting on a, on a chair, presumably a pedestal, a stone chair bench. He's so fat. He hears the bad news about his sons, falls backward, rolls off the back of the pedestal chair and breaks his neck and dies too. Dies in the same day. That's God's reward system on the negative side. I don't want to be part of that. I got, eight, I got eight kids. I want them living, living well, living long, living large, if you will. Amen. And so do you. And we pray for all of our seed after us all the time. Right? So we have to resist slack religious practices. We have to resist slack religious practices at all times. Don't let them come in. Don't let them come into your home. There are movies out there where, you know, take the Lord's name in vain. I burnt more movies, I could tell you. You know, you buy a DVD or a VHS, right? You're watching it, you bought it innocently, you're watching it and you go, wait a minute here. I didn't expect this. And you gotta just get rid of it, you know? When Kathy goes, uh, where's that movie? I'll just kind of give her a look. And it ended up in the fire pit. Right? And I don't even throw them in the dumpster anymore. I don't want someone fishing them out of the dumpster. I burn them. Burn them, in, burn them in our wood burner or burn them out in the fire pit outside, you know, when we're having a campfire at night. There you go. No one is going to get those things again. Amen. Let's go over to uh, a couple more scriptures. Let's go over to Psalm chapter 5, Psalms 5. Starting in verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. Boy, do we love his name here. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love his name here. It's not Jehovah, it's Yahweh. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, Yahweh. You surround him with favor as with a shield. I didn't write that. I couldn't write that. I couldn't concoct that kind of language and I'll put it down into one little, one little sentence. Look at that. You surround him with favor as with a shield. It's got all kinds of imagery in there about how the favor is good. Honor, honor to God comes at a price. And I believe that right now is the time uh, to fix it. 
I, I just believe that right now, today is the time, now is the time, this hour is the time that we get to fix it. Bad Bible teaching causes men to forget the laws of God. It just, it just does. And I see bad Bible teaching everywhere. I mean, how many people can get really emotional at a, at a church service and walk out and say, what did you get out of that? I don't know, but it sure was good. Well, that's not good enough. I like emotion. I, I mean, I'm an emotional person. I, I love, but you got to have some meat with the excitement. You got to go home and just, you, you got to know that you had more than a glass of milk or a milkshake. You got to go home and say, that was a steak and lobster meal. I got fed at that, at that church today. That's important to me because it's important to God. Amen. Amen. Bad Bible teaching causes men to forget the laws of God. And when they forget the laws of God, they're careless in what they let in. They're careless in their home. They're careless what they think is okay and all right in the church. I'll tell you what this does for people that are in bondage. For people that are in bondage, this is a blessing to them. Because people that are in bondage to something know that eventually they're going to get free of that bondage. They know that eventually something's going to break. When this kind of teaching keeps coming in, it breaks the yokes. It just breaks the yoke of bondage. And people sense it. They know it. And this is why we have so many people watching our television broadcast. This is why we have so many people watching live online or, or partnering with us. They know that the yoke will be broken that they're dealing with in their life. Finally, there's one last way that I believe, not, not, probably not the only way, it's over in Isaiah, Isaiah 58. There's one other way that I believe is very important to God. He's a jealous God. Isaiah 58, 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways and seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word. I want to stop. I want to give you a real brief theological history lesson. Okay? Can I do that? Is that okay? We're in church. Um, the Sabbath, Shabbat, Shabbat just means rest or cessation. Shabbat in Hebrew means cessation or it means to stop. And what it meant to God and what it meant to the Jews was, remember, in six days, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. And then we read where Kathy just read in Exodus chapter 20, honor the Sabbath day and make it or call it holy. Now, that was going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What God gave the Jews in the Mosaic Law wasn't a brand new rule. It was a rule that had been violated, but it wasn't a rule that was being violated prior to that by those who knew their God, like Enoch and Noah and Noah's sons and so on. They knew those rules, and those rules got passed on from prior to Noah, on the boat, after the boat, and all those that came out. And remember, Noah was still alive while Abraham was still alive. And if you don't believe that, I have a chart in back. You can get... I made up a logistical chart of who was alive at different time frames. Noah died when Abraham was 58 years old, and they knew each other. Josephus is very clear. The book of Josephus is very clear. Not only did they know each other, but Noah lived with Abraham for a long period of time. All right, so he heard and uh, Abraham heard the laws that were pre-flood laws, those that violated them and those that obeyed them. Okay? And then from Abraham comes the Mosaic uh, law some 400 years later. All right? So now, we have the Sabbath day. The Jews today celebrate Shabbat as being Saturday. And there's a lot of confusion over this. But in the early church, they began calling the first day of the week Today is Sunday, right? Is, today is the first day of the week. The last day of the week, look at your calendars, the last day of the week is Saturday. The early church fathers in the first century began calling Sunday the Lord's Day, referring not Lord as Yahweh, but Lord as Jesus, Lord Jesus. And they began calling it the Lord's Day because the Lord's Day was the day that he was resurrected. They went to the grave. They saw that he was not there. 
That's the Lord's day. So it's the day after Jewish Shabbat, which is Saturday. What is Saturday? Saturday is the last day of the week. Saturday is number seven. Saturday, you could say, is fulfillment. But what is the eighth day, Shabbat? The eighth day is eternity. The eighth day signifies, the eighth day for all humanity will be after after the next 1,000 year millennial reign, which is coming up shortly, at the end of that we have the white throne judgment. It's called the eighth day after the white throne judgment. We're in the eighth day today, theologically speaking, and we're sitting here in, on, on, in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. God gave Muslims a holy day of Friday, Jews a holy day of Saturday, Christians a holy day of Sunday. The day six represents the day of man, carnality. The day seven uh, talks about fulfillment. Without Judaism, there would be no Christianity. But Judaism now is a dead religion by itself. And now we're on the eighth day or the day of eternity. We get to live and reign with him as priests on high from this point forward. It's an eternal day. And so we have the Lord's day. Now, so Isaiah is prophesying something he may or may not be familiar with. Because if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day of the Lord, honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways, seeking your own pleasure, speaking your own word. I'm going to stop again. In the early American colonies... There is a, uh, 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 this actual event, and a book was written, uh, written about it. The book is called Johnny uh, Termaine. It ended up uh, turning into a movie in the uh, middle 50s. It's a colorized movie, very good movie. And anyone who worked on the Sabbath in the first 18, 13 colonies could be hung for working on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day, on Sunday. And this is amongst Christians, not amongst Jews. Because Sabbath violating was known to be wrong for 1,600 years. And so we, Sabbath violating, I mean, I remember when I was a boy, you couldn't buy anything on Sunday. And then I remember the first time you could buy something was when the gas station started opening. And when the governor you know, of the state that I lived in said gas stations can be open just in case people need gas that are traveling. And then before you know it, uh, you know, you had other, had, uh, then you know, if you were a gas attendant, remember the days they ran out there and they pumped your gas and cleaned your windshield and they all wore uniforms. Remember that for <laughs> older people? Right? They wore a hat and they wore a brown uniform. They're cleaning your windshield. And now you got people working on Shabbat on the Sabbath in order for you to pump gas. And then the stores started opening. And then you could go look at cars, but you couldn't buy one. I don't even know what it is in the state of Wisconsin. You still can't buy a car in the state of Wisconsin on Sunday, right? Right? That's right. Right? Eventually someone will change that. That's sad. It used to be that you didn't violate the Sabbath. Why? Because the understanding was is that you gave honor to that day. By giving honor to the day, what did you do? You made Christianity as noticeable as Judaism. And more so because there's more Christians than Jews. Judaism is noticeable, why? Because of the laws they have, particularly of their Sabbath day. Christianity is supposed to make a mark on, if we can't preach the gospel, we can preach it with our feet and have our feet stay home, except for going to church, maybe going to the relatives or something like that. And even refrain from traveling all that much. Um, that's, I, don't I, I mean, I think I've traveled in, in 40 years of, 41 years of marriage, I think I flew out maybe once on a Sunday on a business trip. I flew out of Madison. But knowing in my heart, I didn't really want to do that, but I didn't have any other choice because of the logistics of what I was dealing with. But I'm trying to make sure if I travel, I don't, I don't travel over. And if I'm already on a trip, I try to make sure that I'm not bothering too many. No, look at all the restaurants, right? You go down to Dallas and you go into Dallas or Fort Worth. I've been there, right? And on Sunday, if, I, if, I'm, at a, if I'm at a hotel, you got to eat at a restaurant. But then everyone piles out of their churches, Right? And they come in, they're all wearing their suits and ties, some really big people, some places, you know. And they come in, they all sit down, and they're telling a the waitress, Ah, oh, you should have been in church this morning. You're right? And now you know what the waitresses are thinking. I could have been if you wouldn't come here every single Sunday and demand a meal that you could make for yourself back at your home. I could come to church, but my boss who fire me if, if I can't work. 
And now understandably so, we got policemen that have to work on, on, on Sundays. We have uh, hospital personnel that have to work on Sundays. You've got other types of, uh, of, of clerical and, and computer type jobs that have to be done on Sunday just to keep uh, the grid up. <laughs> you know, we understand that. We're not walking, this is not a dogmatic rule. But as much as is possible, we ought to honor the Sabbath. So when Kathy and I go home, very rarely do we ever get gasoline on, on a Sunday unless like it's on E and I'm smelling the fumes, right? And I, I wasn't thoughtful enough to take the right car in the morning. We go home, we don't travel. If we do, we'll go to something that'll be, you know, festive or something like that, but we really don't travel. Look at this. Verse 13 again, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh, honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own way, seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in Yahweh, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken." When God says that the final thing, Yahweh, I have spoken. This is, I'm going to do this for you. This is why we, my wife and I, we te taught, teach all of our kids. I don't know how many of them honor it all the time, but we gave them great teaching when they were growing up. I hear occasionally they'll tell me, yeah, we're napping this afternoon. That was a big thing in our family. We would nap. You know, go home, take and make all the kids lay down, even when they didn't want to. Then I'd stand at their door for 10 minutes. And as soon as they start messing around, I go, I know you're not sleeping in there. Right? You better go take a nap. Anyway, so, you know, that stuff sticks with kids as they grow up. And I believe just because it's, what I'm preaching is so unpopular, this is a real unpopular thing to talk about in this country. Well, I have to work on Sunday. I'm not talking about you. But what we can do individually is we can make it difficult for an employer to make money on Sunday by just not observing anything uh, that they're offering. We don't have to buy a car on Sunday. We don't even have to look for a car on Sunday. We don't have to get online and look for a car on Sunday. We don't have to take out our laptop and look at cars that are for sale on Sunday. You see what I'm saying? We don't have to do any of that. We don't have to go to the grocery store if we buy enough groceries. I remember when grocery stores first started opening. It was when I was a teenager. But before that, they weren't open on Sunday. They were all closed. Closed Sunday. How many things are, are closed on Sunday anymore? Hardly nothing. And yet, we used to have a Sabbath rule in this country because we were all Christians. God is a jealous God. He made this one day for us to cease from our, our labor, cease from changing the world, with our, cease from stamping our image into the world. What do we do six days a week? We stamp our image in the world. Yes, we do. We plant flowers, we plant rose beds. We put the roses right where we want them. We put the colors of roses right where we want them. We put the, the, we put the patio where we want it, the chair where we want it. We buy the picnic table that we want or, or, the, or the table for our home. We buy a dress or we stamp our image on God's planet, on God's creation six days out of the week. We don't have to do that for one day. One day we can lay back and rest and enjoy God's presence. I'm telling you, if it says here in the word of God, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken, if it says it, that means it. Just because socially in this country we've grown to accept it doesn't mean it's right. Amen. Doesn't mean it's right. And you can do every, even if you have to work on Sundays, fine. But what I would recommend that you do, pray that you don't have to work on Sundays. Right? Come to the house of God. If you're serving in the house of God, come here, worship, you know, uh, greet, uh, drive people here, uh, have uh, music teams, even practicing. But real work where you're stamping your imprint on society and trying to make a living, that's not, that's not for the church. And I believe God is a jealous God and he still honors that today. Those that are in the medical professions or in the, in the police professions, they have to work. They don't have a choice, right? Because people get sick even on Sundays. But for the rest of us, right, we have options. 
We have options. And for those of you who do have to work on Shabbat on Sunday, then make sure you take a day of rest off in, in the rest of the week and call it your Sabbath day. I used to do it all the time as a pastor. I used to have Tuesday as, as my Sabbath day. And then people just didn't know, couldn't get, after five years of me trying that, I, so I just try to take off as much time as possible during the week. Let's all stand. Get something out of that today? Yeah. Give God the glory. Amen. I believe, I believe that observing the Sabbath is a barometer of where your faith is. Can God prosper you in six days? And I believe that he can. Let's pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we, we know that you're a jealous God and a holy God. And we give you honor and we give you praise here today. Father, we ask that you would cause us to be blessed in our coming in and blessed in our going out. And we hold you to your word that you, we read here today that you'll cause us to ride on the heights of the earth. We give you glory for that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen and amen.